everyone, Bernard here. I hope you're all staying safe and well. And welcome to the Citizen Channel. And episode five, yes, episode five of the City Book Club, where we have a look at uh, city related books. It might be players, managers, it might be people who just write about city. Uh, and episode five, we're going to have a look at, a, well, a modern day city legend. Yeah, we're going to have a look at, of course, uh, Sean Golter and his little uh, autobiography. Feed the goat, fantastic. Well, my one of my favourites, one of my lads' first favourites as well. For obviously, um, it was obviously started going in the late eighties. My son and obviously uh, Sean Gold is one of his fondest memories of, of obviously the late nineties and going at that sort of time. So we're going to have a look and what we do read an excerpt from a chapter. Yeah, we have a look at a chapter. We're going to look at chapter fourteen today, which is uh, entitled "Who Let the Goat Out." So we'll have a little chat about it. Anything personal I can add but obviously I'm just going to quote from the book and the chapter about uh, Sean Golter's thoughts so join me today as we have a look at uh, the City Book Club episode 5 uh, Feed the Goat from Sean Golter chapter 14 Who Let the Goat Out? Ooh, I'll do a song. No, I'm not going to sing I might, I might sing while, but while we're doing it at some stage but I won't, I won't sing the songs uh, there you go so please if you're new to the channel push that subscribe button push the bell notification to enjoy what I do loads of city stuff of course uh, past and present uh, also you'll see some stuff on film and tv as well so if that's any interest you want to break from football at any stage uh, have a look at my film and tv stuff as well that'd be much appreciated or if you know someone who might be interested but it's football today and i post loads of stuff on facebook and twitter as well so if you check the links on there and uh, follow or friend me on there i do check every two or three days and follow and friend everyone back on there as well and all comments are welcome about the goat about the, the proper goat isn't it i mean we use the goat uh, goats used about a lot of players now isn't it but uh, yeah, he was the original and our best goat, wasn't he? Let's be honest about it. Uh, so any comments on the goat or any memories that this uh, sort of makes you remember today? Well, this is what usually happens when I mean, you read these books and stuff. You know, oh, yeah, I remember that. And it's sort of hidden away in the depths of your mind somewhere. So let me know in your comments anyway. Of course, if you haven't got time for a comment today, just give, give us a little thumbs up. That'd be fantastic. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, appearances at 189, according to the... Um, Looking through Manchester City, the complete record, of course. Uh, only goes up to uh, the early 2000s, but uh, obviously enough on Sean Golter there. Uh, 189 appearances, 23 appearances of sub, and a lot of those were while, while we're talking in this, this period with uh, Kevin Keegan uh, as, as manager. He scored 103 goals, of course, between 1998 and 2003, and he made his debut on the 28th of March 1998 in a 2-1 loss at Bradford. So that's a shame. And his last game was another loss as well. So he didn't start off and finish very well, did he? But there you go, of course. It was the very famous last game at Main Road, wasn't it? Uh, Southampton on May the 11th, 2003. And what Chapter 14 does, yeah, who let the go out? Chapter 14 looks at the build-up to the 2002-2003 season, which, unknown to us and unknown to the GOAT at the time, would, would be his, la his last as a player. Obviously, he spends a lot of time back at City now, obviously doing uh, media stuff, but it uh, would be his last as a player in a, in a sky blue shirt, of course, um, with, the, with the move... Uh, to the Etihad, he didn't. He didn't make it, did he? He'd gone by the time we'd left Main Road. He was, he was obviously on his way as well from from Manchester City. So we go back to his first little thing on on the build up to this season. So he explains uh, at the start of the chapter. While I was at home in Bermuda, I heard that City had signed an Elka, who I thought was an excellent acquisition for the club. He was a good player. I'd seen him playing the Champions League final and knew of his exploits at Arsenal. He had a bit of a history of being problematic at his previous clubs, but I liked to take people as I found them, and that was how I would base our friendship. By the time I returned to England, Mark Vivian Foe, Sylvain Distant, and Peter Schmeichel had all arrived too. Uh, big names with lofty reputations. Yeah, so I'm having sure to uh, sure Mark have felt his uh, nose a bit out of joint of all these new faces appearing. Uh, but my approach was that I'd seen a few expensive strikers off in the past, so why couldn't I see off a few more? Uh, I was up for the challenge, and that was for sure. I did not come in thinking I was past my sell-by date. Just that this was the level I aimed for, and now I had to get down to the hard work again. But I also had to contend with Keegan and his views. Yeah, I don't think they got on very well. As to what I could and could not do, and what was an entirely different battle. I knew an Elka could benefit my game because he would attract defenders and create space for me. And also he had the ability to make chances out of nothing. 
I hoped you would get the chance to play alongside each other and Elk illustrates that we were paying out a lot of big salaries now but that did not bother me because I felt that if you were happy to sign for a sum one week you shouldn't complain if somebody signed a week later and got more. Very philosophical last year, wasn't he? Uh, you shouldn't complain that's uh, got more because you were fine the week before. I just thought, well done to those lads. That was what the club wanted to pay them. There were a lot of strikers at Main Road now, but so as I felt, I had a chance. My future was with City and nobody would have been able to entice me away. Keegan was still my motiva motivation, although he still did not know. Uh, training was going well. I knew if Keegan wanted to push me out of the picture, he would have the City fans to deal with because they were 100% behind me. Yeah, it's it's already a legend by then, wasn't he? And would no doubt be keen to speak on my behalf. If he wanted his own big name signings in, he was going to be under pressure from the supporters because they always seemed to want me to play and their backing was unwavering and unconditional. I hope that things will go well and I would overcome the latest set set of hurdles placed in front of me but it's not until several games into the campaign that I finally played yeah it was a, actually a Worthington Cup game against uh, Crew Alexandra was his uh, first full game of the season he had a few sub appearances uh, as I sustained a toe fracture in July 2002 in a friendly game against Huddersfield uh, when one of their young players landed on my foot coming on as a substitute at Arsenal Keegan preferred the Anelka hooker be pairing and I knew I had to hide uh, bide my time yet again and wait for a chance. I've been here before and knew what it took to ride the storm. Yet I was particularly hurt when Keegan started a home game against Blackburn uh, with reserve team winger Chris Shuker. Chris Shuker, eh? Up front instead of me. I asked Keegan why he had not given me the chance to start the game and he gave me the usual waffle. Uh, he was searching for a partner for an Elka but it seemed he was determined to play anyone rather than me. However, I did come on as a substitute within a few minutes Danny Tiato was sent off for a foul on David Thompson. We were losing 2-0 but an Elka pulled one back and I scored a late equaliser to secure a 2-2 draw. I think Keegan actually made some more positive comments about me after the game. Uh, that was a first. Uh, he spoke of Seattle's tackle to the press, but I do not recall him saying anything to me in the dressing room. Yeah, so talking about the saying, yeah, because it was early October, and obviously you've seen the image of the of the Worthington Cup game there. I think there's twenty, just over twenty one thousand there that night. I was I was there with my lad that night. So yeah, he talks about. Uh, he goes on to talk about another striker called, uh, obviously absolutely forgotten by me, uh, Matthias Vuos Vuosa. The also Argent, who was actually partnered for Land recently and obviously came to City for, uh, I think it was an estimate for between three and a half and four million pounds. So it wasn't cheap, but uh, apparently uh, Keegan had told him he wasn't going to play, although obviously I've read in programmes since that uh, he wasn't sure of the reason he didn't play a game for City. He played in the reserves, he didn't play a game for City. Uh, but Keegan had told him he wouldn't play unless he learnt English, so... You know, that was probably something that sort of happens more now, doesn't it? Perhaps and would have happened in those days. As I said, he was a top scorer for the reserves, but never never actually... I think he got to the subs bench once, but he never actually made a full appearance for City. Uh, he goes on to talk, of course, of the other, another little sort, sort of mini, mini list City uh, legend in, in uh, Ali Benabi, who was then the, the captain of the team. And he'd seemed to be concentrating more on less less on playing football and actually doing more of the coaching side and uh, Sean wasn't quite sure about this and the players weren't quite sure about this at the time and he was sort of in and out of Keegan's Kevin Keegan's office all the time as he's uh, sort of becoming his number two if you like even though he's obviously still playing as well. He goes on to say that the defeat to Southampton in October 2002, 2-0, was the sort of day that Keegan had sort of lost the guys in the dressing room then, obviously that the guys who were there that perhaps weren't brought in by Keegan. Uh, and it was a game where we, we actually got booed off, they actually got booed off the pitch by City fans. No, never, never, never. But yeah, we used to do a lot of that in those days. Not not so much now, obviously, but uh, certainly in those days. We weren't afraid to boo the players, that's for sure, even though we loved most of them. <laughs> we weren't afraid to boo the players. Uh, and yeah, Sean was in and out of the team but he, as I said he made that full appearance in the Worthington Cup uh, but he's never really sure of his place as Keegan chopped and changed he was uh, totally unaware really by I mean the next little segment we're going to look at uh, and the sort of final sort of brings a conclusion to his uh, chapter uh, he wasn't he wasn't actually aware on November that when it came to November the 9th 2002 which is a significant date I mean if I look at that program there uh, that his goal tally had stood at 98 at that point uh, there is mention of it in the program etc 
keep your eyes peeled there will be a special uh, city moments in time coming out about this uh, this game uh, this 3-1 victory over united uh, but yeah he wasn't aware that his goal tally stood at 98 uh, as the as the main road derby loomed uh, united were well placed that season they were third although obviously i think arsenal were sort of uh, well ahead at the time but only only a about a third of the way, only about uh, just over a third of the way through the season. Uh, City Bowl was struggling down in 14 for the two or three point gap per uh, cushion to the relegation places. But uh, again, we weren't doing fantastic. So yeah, again, uh, Sean takes up the the story of these yeah, of this it's uh, of this uh, approach to this game. It was the last main or derby ever, so we knew we had to beat United for our fans, but we had our work cut out. Lucian Matomo and Jared Vikins replaced Distant and Steve Howey, Howey, who Howey, Howey, <laughs> who were both absent, and we started as underdogs. Well, we normally normally did in those days. I had stood United and knew that if I scored against them, it would not be. To, enough to get over excited because they had habit of coming back I think we all agree mate we all knew that uh, to remain calm until we were certain of a victory was the best approach yeah I probably waited for about a third minute of injury time and a couple of gold cushion before I got giddy about beating United to be honest with you it felt good to be on the stage in front of our supporters this was the opportunity I'd been waiting for I was upset that Beckham and Roy Keane were out because if we beat them I wanted us to beat all of United not be able to make up excuses yeah so they were slightly weakened by that weren't they I must admit but hey we've we played enough derbies with a with a weakened team. This game for me showed the true quality of Gerard Beacons. Whenever he was called upon to do a job, he did it superbly. In fact, whenever he marked me in training, I always had a difficult time. On this day, he marked Ruud van Nistelrooy as well, as I've seen anyone do. Gerard was not the quickest, but he read the game well, and that day he did not allow Ruud a sniff. Yeah, Gerard Beacons quality. I had watched Rue's game over a couple of seasons and come to the conclusion that our games were not a million miles apart and neither of us seemed to get many, if any, goals outside the box. Well, that's a nice style of play, was it? And the fact that Gerard marked Rude as well as he did uh, as he did me, proved we had a similar style. Every time Rude made a move, Gerard had him in shackles, as if to say, "I've got you. You're going no. You're not going anywhere." I was very relaxed as we kicked off. Uh, I'm glad he was. I think I was. I am. Many City fans weren't. Uh, and Elka scored an early goal to put us one nil up. But Paul Skull soon made it 1-1. It was a fast, exciting game, but when Mark Vivian Fowey played a long ball up front, he miscued it and he was heading out for a goal kick. As the ball rolled towards the line, I thought, I could make the ball... A uh, bad ball into a good ball. Gary Neville seemed to be trying to shepherd the ball out as I chased him down. I could see the ball was going out. I expected him to shield it as I as I challenged him, but then he decides to play it back to Fabian Bartes. I anticipated his next move and put in a block tackle, and the ball stayed in play. I head I edged him out of the way, took the ball in towards goal, but there was no, there was nobody for me to square the ball to. I was on my own, so I went along the goal line and tried to angle back in a little before hitting the ball low past Bartes and into the net while the fans went hysterical i stuck to my guns and avoided getting too excited because united have plenty more left and we're not about to roll over i've seen enough teams fall into that trap of thinking the game was won and end up losing yeah i mean i must admit i think i did celebrate a little bit when uh, when that game but you have to don't you but uh, yeah you probably at the back of your mind you do think uh, it's all gonna go uh, pear-shaped unfortunately we were playing well and I was feeling good all the time, thinking now they're going to see the, then the, now they're going to see the real Sean Goater. I was up against Laurent Blanc and Rio Ferdinand, and I found the game very easy. I was spinning off them, laying balls out wide or into aisle, and then letting him take over. We went in 2-1 up, at which point I heard Feed the Goat as its loudest ever. The fans had come up with a new song, Who Let the Goat Out? Yeah, I think we had three or four songs for, for Sean Goat. I didn't to come on, feed with the goals, 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 and all of that sort of I mean, I think at least I think he's one of the most... Uh, uh, in history, I would have think the most sung about, you know, where we made most songs about a player, to be honest with you. Uh, and I thought I'm having that one as he as he listened to let, who let the goats out. I like the tune; it reminded me of a summer in Bermuda. So I was very happy with the City fans' latest release. Early in the second half, Ayl picked up the ball in the middle as I ran in field. I saw a gap behind the defenders and began to sprint into it, knowing Ayl would find me. He played a perfectly weighted pass into my stride. I had to hold off two defenders, but delayed my shot until I drew closer and closer to goal. Choosing the right moment to pull the trigger would be the key. And having studied United, I knew Bart as his 
habits as, as a sharp and agile keeper. If you hit the ball in low, he had the ability to make some fantastic saves. Knowing that his strength lay in low shots, I had always thought that if I ever was a one-on-one -on -one with him, I'd dink it over him. As I held off the defenders and the ball bounced in front of me, allowing me to make a gentle half volley over Bartes, who had gambled on the low shot. The ball gently bounced into the back of the net. That was 3-1 and also turned out to be my 100th goal for the club. Well done, Sean. Although I didn't know it at the time, I ran off to United fans saying, shh, uh, and I, can, I can't hear you anymore. I celebrated that goal a bit more than the first one, but I still wanted to remain cautious. There was still quite a bit of time left. I waited so long for this moment against United, who represented a yardstick in English football, as I was concerned. As a youngster in Bermuda, this had been the team I wanted to play against because they were the team to beat today it may be Chelsea but back then it was United yes I must have been right and this is Chelsea were sort of dominating the league we held out comfortably to win 3-1 and walked off to an incredible rendition of feed the goal and he will score followed by who let the goal out what an amazing way to end a fantastic day this was the first time that City had beaten United in 13 years yeah, we don't. We celebrate. We used to celebrate like mad those days. We had taken four points off United that season, and I did wonder if that made a difference to their title challenge. I was really pleased for Gerard too, because he had played magnificently, and he deserved all the plaudits that came his way. Gerard had the same attitude as I, in that he always did his best when he came into the side, and accepted being left out with good grace, even if he was not happy about it. The whole team played really well that day. All I wanted now was a shirt, and I didn't mind whose I got. They were all good players. I did like Skulls because he was an England international. I didn't mind Skulls actually as a player, and kept sort of well, well on a, on the basis of I hated most of them. But uh, there you go. I did like Skulls because he was an England international, kept a low profile. But I got a rejection when one of our security guys went and inquired in their dressing room. It's all packed away, he was told. Uh, I walked up to Keegan's room near the tunnel, and Ferguson was in there. I asked him how he was doing and whether there was any chance I could get. Skulls his shirt. I think it was treated to what is now commonly known as a hairdryer treatment from the Reds boss. I was glad when I had scored against his team that day and my only regret was I did not have the chance to ask him to sign the match ball too. I don't, I don't think he would have bothered to be honest with you mate. Two goals was good enough. Somebody mentioned to me that the only person who had scored three goals against United that season was Ronaldo in the Champions League game. I left empty handed but not too bothered. It was a proud day for me. And my family as I drove home. I thought that surely now I had one Keegan over. He did not say anything special to me after the game. And my well done was no different from anyone else's. So there you go. That's uh, reading from chapter 14 there. So yeah. Um, the two. Yeah. Let's say the two goals he scored. Obviously got the normal well done from Keegan. So there's obviously something there with Keegan wasn't there. So I will dip into this book again. And, and have a look at that uh, relationship. And see if he expands on it a little bit more. Uh, and he actually won a man of the match for that game. From the uh, uh, one of the main sponsors for that for that game. And who wanted Keegan to actually present it with Sean Golter. After the game. But uh, Keegan had apparently been far too busy. And, and Sean didn't even know this. It was literally more months later when he actually was given this probably when he was about to leave the club when he was actually given it uh, and so I don't think he was given it by Keegan but uh, there you go so that's the sort of thing there was a, a sort of a, a very iffy iffy relationship with, uh, wasn't there uh, of course, uh, that uh, the last home game against Southampton will be Sean's last uh, and on an emotional day. We didn't really realise we were not only saying goodbye to our beloved main road at the time, but we're also saying goodbye to Sean as a player. Anyway, as I say, he's still here now. He's in his, his sort of media media side, etc. But uh, he was one of our modern day legends, wasn't he? And one of the heroes of '99, of course, which. Uh, Obviously, is is close to most uh, City fans' hearts who who know that time and remember that time. So it's nice to read from this book. As I say, I'm sure there'll be more on this, and I'll go back in time, and there'll be stuff on ninety nine. As I say, with all these books, I do I do check back and flip from period to period. So there's no specific order in these books. I'll go back and perhaps uh, remember Sean Golter's thoughts of the ninety nine and stuff like that in in future issues to come over the months and years. I hope you'll join me for that anyway. Uh, please check out my other four. I say this was episode five. Please check out episode one, which was uh, Manchester City, my team by Mike Doyle. I'll put the links on the on the actual thing on the screen, etc., and underneath. Uh, episode two was football with a smile. Yeah, Joe Mercer and Gary James. Episode three was Dennis Stewart, my football journey. 
in episode four, of course, was Colin Bell, Reluctant Hero, Autobiography with Ian Cheeseman. So excerpts from all those books. So if you missed out on any of those, have, have a look and uh, have a look back and uh, check those out as well. But I hope you enjoyed this. Say, let me let me know in your comments any specific memories you've got. As I said, my one of my lads first first favourite, favourite players. I mean, he's one of my, uh, you know, he's one of mine, but obviously there's a lot, I had a lot more to have as favourite players well before um, Sean came along, but he certainly is one of my, still one of my uh, City heroes, like like he will be most uh, City fans heroes. Anyway, thanks for joining me. What are we going to do the rest of the day? Have a great one. Look after yourselves, look after your friends, look after your families. Money, poorly. Let's all look after each other. Until we meet here again on the Citizen channel, or perhaps you have a flit across. Have a look at my film and TV channel. I only ever ask you to do one thing. Stay safe, Blues. Come on, City. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.